Good morning, First Presbyterian Church of Oakland. We are so glad that you are here. Can we all, uh, maybe you could find the little reaction at the bottom and give a hand clap uh, to Bex. They are juggling the sound uh, in the sanctuary and Zoom crashing uh, <laughs> several times. So let us have lots of grace for each other this morning. Um, if you suddenly get knocked off, it is not because our digital deacon kicked you out. It is because Zoom uh, knocked you off. It seems like there are troubles around. Uh, just a reminder to keep yourself muted. You may want to click on original sound up in the left corner. Um, I think Zoom is also having some trouble with music and sound, but make sure you have it on original sound. But we are glad that you're with us. Please use the chat um, to add comments. Um, reach out to each other. Um, it is great. I actually like the part of Zoom where we admit each person because I get to see your name. Imagine you coming into church. Usually when we are in the church building, I only get to say good morning to a few of you, but it feels like good morning as we uh, allow you to come in. Know that the Spirit has prepared this place, even this digital place, for us to gather. May we be comforted. May we be guided. May we be challenged. Uh, may we be formed to be the church that God needs in the world. Amen. Dorothy will uh, lead us in our call to worship this morning. If you're speaking, I can't hear you yet. Thank you, Matt. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Poor and despairing, come to be blessed. Hungry or tired, come to be restored. Sorrowing or sighing, come to discover joy. Bring your tired, your poor. Share your hopes, your dreams. Embrace your doubts, your fears. Come as you are. All are welcome here. Let us pray. God of blessings and woes, bless us with your presence this day. Reveal your way forward and guide us in pathways of hope and grace. In your blessed name we pray, amen.
Amen. We now come, just as we have heard where the balm is, it is important that we come in confession, come recognizing our need for that balm, recognizing our need for that healing. We have a rather long confession today. I think it is important. Sometimes we lean into longer prayer section or longer preaching time. Today is a longer uh, confession about our relationships with one another. Um, about racism in our culture, um, about the healing that we need uh, and desperately seek. Uh, so join with me. Um, I'll read the leader parts and you can join in the all from your um, different places, different homes. Let us confess. Where we have not understood, have we ever sought to understand? Where we have, been, where we have swallowed lies for the fear of the truth, tuned out the cries of those whose eyes have seen the darkness and turned our cheek toward those whose lives have felt the sting of oppression. Lord, forgive us for our apathy. People were in need and we closed our eyes so as not to see them. For to see a brother is to acknowledge his humanity and to see a sister is to acknowledge their likeness, a co-ruler, a co-creator, a co-laborer, fashioned by God, for God and in the image of God, where we refuse to see God's image in a stranger, an inferior, a foe. Lord, forgive us for our pride. Where we have denied our worth, your worth and been careless with your dignity, blaming you for your own oppression, judging the slave for not being the master, but never the master for not freeing the slave where we have neither questioned our miseducation nor welcomed one another's truth. Lord, forgive us for hardening our hearts. Seeking good for ourselves, we denied our siblings, disobeying the command to be their keeper and keeping for ourselves what we were called to give, where we have loved ourselves more than our neighbor, loved our power more than offered obedience to our Savior. Lord, forgive us for our greed. Where you have suffered while we prospered and sat idly by, where our power spoke truth to no one and our privilege granted selfish gain, where we have not laid down our lives but rather moved further from you so that we could rise. Lord, forgive us for oppressing. Where we were silent when you needed us to speak, where we were silent when you needed us to raise our voice, where we were silent when we had not been silenced. Our voice had wings while your voice was stolen. Lord, forgive us for our silence. Where safety and comfort have been our closest companions, where we could not risk disrupting racial blindness by disciplining our eyes to see our crime was our indifference in the pursuit of our affluence. Indifference worse than hatred, not only wounds but kills. For the price of our life, liberty and happiness is your blood, freedom and prosperity. Lord, forgive us our sin, the repentance. We acknowledge our privilege and power unearned. We turn away from our apathy and indifference. Lord, grant us our forgiveness. We confess our sins to one another as we seek healing. We long for all that has broken to be made whole. Lord, grant us grace, your grace. We petition that our hardened hearts no longer be of stone and our eyes now waken never again be closed. Lord, grant us your mercy and the repair. May your kingdom come and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. May our hearts long for just relationships and our words work toward healing wounds. May our actions promote justice and equity and our prayers be for peace and unity. Lord, re repent and commit to make repairs. Amen. Take a few moments to think of the repairs, to ask the Spirit to guide us in the steps and actions of repairs that we should take.
If we were in person this morning, I would invite all of us to walk outside of the sanctuary. I know, a little bit scandalous, uh, to leave our seats and to walk out and see this magnolia tree that is kind of between the 27th Street uh, side entrance to the sanctuary and the entrance to the Fellowship Hall area. And I would have us uh, see these leaves that are blooming. They're coming out. To me, they are a visual sign of new life, of God's grace, and in this case, God's forgiveness. People of God know what we have confessed is forgiven, that God invites us to bloom into new life, life that shows that repair, shows that hope, shows that healing of relationship, both interpersonally and also larger in community and structures and institutions. May we live lives worthy of the forgiveness that we feel today. Amen. We come now to our time of prayer. We have one slide here. You may have seen in the email this morning, um, but uh, Lawrence Ray, longtime member of our community, um, died on Friday night after about a week of being in hospice care. Um, he had, uh, don't know all the circumstances of his sickness. I did visit him many times over this last year. It was very clear uh, last Friday when I spoke with him and even planned out a memorial service that he was ready to be done with hospitals and medicine and away from home. So he got to spend the last week of his life at home with friends, uh, church members and neighbors around him. I especially want to lift up uh, Maria, his neighbor, and Scott, his childhood friend, uh, who were a deep part of these last uh, year of his life, helping to uh, guide and comfort Lawrence and advocate for him. They were an example to me of what we can all be as we care for our neighbors. But we uh, lift up uh, Lawrence's life. We will have a memorial together. I will be reaching out to uh, Maria and Scott and planning with them and others, um, and we will let you know that. But we want to lift up uh, this image of him uh, as well as his memory. It would be, uh, we can lift up all different prayers. If any would like to uh, add a prayer for Lawrence or appreciation, you can add that in this space as well. But are there any who bring uh, additional prayers or appreciations this morning? You can lift up your hand. You can type them in the chat. Okay. Hi. I just wanted to um, bring up a memory of Lawrence. Please. When, so Matthew had gone to Arkansas to, um, on a pilgrimage um, to the um, internment camp that was there. And when he came back, he was, asked to share from the pulpit about his experience and obviously it was really very difficult he had planned it out and he went up there and uh, I think it was Leah at the time that went up and just kind of stood next to him and he got choked up um, at get delivering his um, his uh, testimony and paused um, several times and Lawrence was in the back of the sanctuary at the time and you could hear his voice just coming to the front and he just said and I don't even remember exactly what he said but something like we're with you Matthew and you know just supporting him so um, I'm really missing Lawrence right now and um, I dug out his um, something that he had um, put together and it's a study and I'm thinking maybe you know with BBC that we would um, make copies of this and do um, the study uh, in his honor in his memory. Hmm. 
Thank, Thank you for lifting that up, Susie. Di writes, I was so grateful for Lawrence's support over the years and all his wonderful contributions to our worship service. He had a great gift with words. We had wonderful conversations about faith. If you do not know, Lawrence was an avid poet as well. Published an early um, book of poetry as well as continued to write throughout his life. Um, posted many of those poems as well for others to enjoy and to be guided by. Any others who would lift up appreciation for Lawrence or other prayers that we bring? I see one from Linda praying for her mother. I think I read that correctly. Lift up prayers for Susie, who uh, will undergo a back surgery this Thursday. Uh, prayers for her successful surgery and recovery. I want to continue to lift up prayers for the Witt family, and especially JJ and the passing of his mother. Prayers of comfort and guidance and next steps. Prayers for uh, Gay's nephew, Rob Jones, recovering from a major surgery in Southern California. Wow. Oh, would you like to share, Henry? Go ahead. Sorry, I muted you. You'll have to unmute yourself again. If you're talking, I can't hear you yet. Henry, I cannot hear you. Could you unmute yourself? I'm not sure what Henry you're referring to. I didn't. Oh, have it's uh, not you, not you, Henry Gardner. Are you oh, right. yeah. Are you hearing me now? Yes, sorry, that was my fault. Ah, okay, <laughs> okay, I'll take. It. I just returned from Cameroon after three weeks. Uh, I just want to thank God for Johnny Messis, and also thank everyone for your prayers uh, mm -hmm. while I was out. Mm -hmm. uh, it was quite an emotional trip for me after losing a lot of family members, including my immediate older sister, my mother-in-law, my aunt. Mm. on my cousin. It was also nice to meet uh, the rest of my family members, my siblings, mm. my friends, uh, members of my former uh, congregation, mm. uh, the First Presbyterian Church in Cameroon, in Boya. So that was very nice. They extend greetings to, to everyone. Mm. And I'm glad to be back home. Mm. Thank you for sharing. Glad that you were able to make this trip. Yeah. Thank you. Others that would lift up prayers or gratitudes, or appreciations. Uh, we do give thank you for uh, our uh, lift up celebration of Matthew's life today. Uh, it's his birthday. Uh, Susie did not put what number in the chat it might be around that time you don't say numbers anymore but uh we lift up appreciation for matthew and hope for a celebration and appreciate your life is julia typing or is she uh joining in the speaking she's typing okay Leah has asked for prayer because she had her last day at her job in the cafe and she's looking for another job. Mm -hmm. We lift up prayers for a new job. Or if anyone's hiring, we could answer the prayer here as well. <laughs> yeah. 
Let us continue to lift up prayers for all of our unhoused neighbors uh, who need places, affordable places to stay. Uh, especially within the city planning process right now, of longer plan and the resources. May there be a creativity and imagination um, for how there could be housing for everyone. Let's take a few moments of silence and I'll close in prayer and we'll pray the Lord's Prayer together. Let us pray. God, we come before you uh, knowing that there are places of goodness, places of hope, places of beauty around us. We sense those, yet we are heavy this morning. We are heavy with the passing of Lawrence, uh, the quickness of that and the uh, uncertainty of that. Give you thanks for his uh, relationships around him, his uh, choices and his um, comfort, his leadership, his wise words that have guided this community and have added uh, in so many ways. We grieve uh, his loss. We also lift up other griefs around us those who are sick, those who are recovering, those without homes, those who have lost loved ones. There is much uh, lament, much sadness, uh, much hurt. I ask that you would always guide us as a church, that we would be your comforting community. We would uh, not only speak your words, we would show who you are in our actions, in our love, in our welcome. May we each day uh, be building your beloved community. Let us pray as Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our reading this morning is from Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, a French Jesuit priest who was educated as a theologian, a philosopher, and a paleontologist. Trust in the slow work of God above all, trust in the slow work of God. We are quite naturally impatient in everything to reach the end without delay. We should like to skip the intermediate stages. We are impatient of being on the way to something unknown, something new. And yet it is the law of all progress that progress is made by passing through some stages of instability and that it may take a very long time. And so I think it is with you. Your ideas mature gradually, let them grow, let them shape themselves without undue haste. Don't try to force them on as though you could be today what time, that is to say, grace and circumstances acting on your own goodwill will make of you tomorrow. Only God could say what this new spirit gradually forming within you will be. Give our Lord the benefit of believing that his hand is leading you and accept the anxiety of feeling yourself in suspense and incomplete. And our scripture this morning is from Paul's letter of introduction to the Roman church, Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. For the word in scripture, the word made flesh, and the word in our hearts. Thanks be to God.
Well, good afternoon or good morning, First Presbyterian Church. It is indeed an honor to be with you and speak to you on this day. Even though it's Super Bowl Sunday, it uh, is really appropriate because I'm going to talk to you about the Super Bowl of civil rights cases. This is a story of the three Supreme Court cases that form the foundation for civil rights in this country. Dred Scott, Plessy versus Ferguson, Brown versus Board of Education. But because law is a human thing, it is also a story of the Supreme Court justices who decided these cases and the people impacted by them. These cases spanned almost 100 years. People suffered, the courts failed us during most of the time. The question on the hearts of the suffering was, where was God? But I have found that God was there all the time, making moves, performing miracles. We just did not see him. So buckle up, this will be a bumpy ride. I bring you back <clears throat> to the year 1857. The country was teetering on the brink of civil war over the issues of slavery. There was an unsteady balance of 19 free states and 15 slave states and Congress had attempted to maintain this balance and keep the peace by not disturbing slavery where it existed, but limiting slavery, slavery's expansion into the Northern territories. But slavery was evil and evil can never be balanced. There would be a price to pay. Into this drama, Dred Scott stepped. Let me introduce you to Dred Scott. <clears throat> Dred Scott was an enslaved person residing in Missouri with his wife and two children. His master was an army surgeon who took Dred with him to his military posts in Illinois and then Wisconsin hiring him out to local farmers to earn some extra money and eventually returning him to, Miss, to Missouri. Missouri was a slave state. Slavery was banned in both Illinois and Wisconsin territory. And under the law, if a master took a slave to live in a slave territory, state or territory where slavery was banned for an expend, extended period, usually six months. At that point, the enslaved person became free. The rule was known as the once free, always free rule. Dredd had been in Illinois and Wisconsin for over four consecutive years. On returning to Missouri, he tried first to buy his freedom, but his master refused. Accordingly, Dredd sued in federal court, contending that he had automatically become free by residing in the, a free state and territory. The facts were undisputed. There were hundreds of cases like this. Red Scott seemed to have a good case and his good case worked its way up to the Supreme Court. But we will find that justice can depend on the judge. The judge would, who would write the opinion in this case was Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Roger Taney. Let me introduce you. Roger Taney was born to a wealthy aristocratic slaveholding family in Maryland. He had personally owned slaves. He was a political man having served in several cabinet positions in the administration of Andrew Jackson, including Secretary of War. 
Taney was pro-slavery pro and believed that slavery should not only be protected, but expanded. He wanted his decision in Dred Scott to be, case to be the last word on slavery. That was the judge. The decision, Taney reading the opinion of the court thundered from the bench. Those of African-American descent, whether enslaved or free, were not, could not be, nor were they ever intended to be citizens of the United States. The privileges and rights guaranteed to citizens under the Constitution did not apply to Blacks. That Blacks had no rights that a white person is bound to respect. That because Dred Scott was not a citizen, he could not even bring his suit in federal court. That Blacks were not people under the Constitution. That they, we, were property. And wanting to make sure all hope of emancipation was dead, Taney added, Congress had no power to limit slavery in the territories. Taney's decision, though it had deliberately mischaracterized the Constitution, now was the law of the land. Only two of the nine justices dissented. The highest court had spoken. There could be no appeal. This decision was designed by Taney to permanently take away not only the rights of black people, but also our personhood, our humanity, our souls. It was designed to define us as property to permanently kill all possibility of freedom. Hope seemed gone. The court had failed us. We needed a power stronger than the Supreme Court to counter this decision. We needed God. But where was God? Did Justice Taney have the last word? But God was there making moves. The reaction was fast and furious. Taney's decision sparked a furious series of events no one could have predicted. It unified the often feuding abolitionist groups and gave them steel. It invigorated the people of the free states and territories who now feared that slavery could be expanded else, everywhere. And more importantly, the decision ignited Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln had been a somewhat obscure local politician in Illinois. However, this decision transformed him into a fierce, effective opponent of slavery, thrusting him into the national arena and thrusting him into the White House. The cause of freedom now had a powerful champion. But the decision sparked the Civil War and terrible suffering. Lincoln in dismay over the nation's suffering during the Civil War wondered out loud why. He posed a prov provocative question, answer to this question in his second inaugural address. He said that perhaps the Civil War may be God's punishment for the sin of slavery. But out of this terrible struggle came the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution, called the Civil War Amendments, abolishing slavery, providing citizenship, the right to vote, and the precious rights of equal protection under the law. What Taney had decided, had designed to pro protect slavery, abolished it. God had used the Chief Justice Taney decision for good. Our constitution was made better, but there was more work to do. We fast forward 30 years. In the years after the Civil War, the rights guaranteed by the Civil War amendments were being eroded. 
even in the North, states began to chip away at the right of equal protection. The Northern states had been and were against slavery, but equality with Blacks, well, that was an entirely different question. The Constitution had changed, but hearts had not. States began passing segregation laws, restricting Black people from equal access or treatment in public transportation, education, housing, accommodations, voting, and more. 23 states, more than half of the states in the union had passed segregation laws, the infamous Jim Crow laws, and significantly, there had only been 11 states in the Confederacy. Black people were suffering. Thus began the next chapter of this drama. It started in Louisiana with a man called or named Homer Plessy. The state of Louisiana passed the separate rail car act that required equal but separate rail cars for white and colored people. Their words. There was nothing sub subtle about Louisiana's approach. This was in your face, state sanctioned segregation based on race and color. Civil rights leaders in Louisiana decided upon an act, a radical act of civil disobedience. They drafted Homer Plessy, a black man, to purchase a first class ticket, board a train, and sit in the whites only car, defying the law. But the train company had been tip tipped off. Plessy was quickly removed from the train arrested, tried, find, found guilty, and fined. Plessy filed a lawsuit alleging his rights under the 14th Amendment were violated. The case went all the way to the Supreme Court under the name of Plessy versus Ferguson. Ferguson was the judge who had sentenced him. It seemed like a clear case. Louisiana statute was in direct conflict with the Equal Protection Clause. So we would give the Supreme Court another chance. But we have learned that justice depends on the judge and can be elusive. The judge was Henry Billings Brown. Let me introduce you. Justice Brown would write the opinion of the court he was from a wealthy, aristocratic, Massachusetts family. He was educated at Yale and Harvard. He was described by Supreme Court historians as a reflexive social elitist whose opinions of women, African-Americans, Jews, and immigrants seem odious to us now, though unexceptional for their time. Unfortunately, that was the judge. His opinion he wrote on May 18, 1896 was confounding. He first conceded that the 14th Amendment intended equal protection under the law, but then he concluded segregation is legal so long as the facilities or accommodation are equal. Let me just quote him. The object of the 14th Amendment was undoubtedly to ensure the absolute equality of the two races before the law. But in the nature of things, it could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based upon color or to enforce social as distinguished from political equality or a commingling of the two races upon terms unsatisfactory to either. In a single cavalier statement, Justice Brown had ignored the Constitution and the people it was designed to protect. He codified into law 
the separate of, but equal doctrine as it uh, became to be known, giving new life, energy, and fury to racist Jim Crow laws, encourage, encouraging their expansion throughout the nation. All but one of the justices supported the opinion. The Malone dissenter, Justice Harlan wrote, the 14th Amendment intended a colorblind constitution where all were treated equally. But the Supreme Court had spoken. There could be no appeal. The courts had failed us again. The case was closed. In the Dred Scott case, there were two dissenters. Here, only one. It seemed we were losing ground, but what truly broke our hearts was that this case created hardly a stir, a stir outside of the legal community. There was no outrage like in Dred Scott. No one seemed to care. Where was God? We were beaten, or were we? Even this travesty would be redeemed. God was at work making moves, but these were different times and there was no Abraham Lincoln. A new strategy was needed. A new champion was needed and destiny would provide such a champion, a lawyer with a new strategy and the courage to carry it out. Carry it out. But it would take another 50 long, hard years for this plan to come together. The lawyer, Charles Hamilton Houston. Let me introduce you to Charles Hamilton Houston. Charles Houston's father had been a former slave. Charles Houston earned many scholarships. He became a, the valedictorian of his Amherst College, college class. He graduated from Harvard Law. He was the dean of Howard Law School, special counsel to the NAACP. He had argued eight cases before the US Supreme Court, winning seven. And he was a tactical genius. Charles Houston's new approach, he reasoned that if separate but equal was now the law of the land, then instead of fighting the law, he would use it. It would be like legal judo. He would focus on segregated schools and prove that the separate, separate school facilities for blacks were always grossly un, underfunded and unequal. That the black children were being harmed by this inequality and that the public would never devote the funds necessary to make the schools equal. He assembled a team of lawyers and went to work. They selected school segregation cases from all over the country, one in which the supposedly equal school systems would not provide even one high school for black children. Significantly, all the salaries for the te teachers in the black schools were very low. And in all the cases, the, there were not, the school system did not provide libraries, cafeterias, or any of the necessary amenities for the black students. By 1953, these cases were combined, brought together under the name Brown versus Board of Education. Sadly, Charles Houston died before his case could reach the Supreme Court, but his work was continued and carried on by his remarkable Lieutenant Thurgood Marshall. Thurgood Marshall took over. The case was ready and so was a legal team, but we needed the right judge, a judge with wisdom, a judge God could work with. The juror judge who would write the opinion in this case 
was Chief Justice Earl Warren. Warren, let me introduce you. Born in Los Angeles to a working class immigrant family, educated at UC Berkeley, where he received his under, undergraduate and law degrees. His first legal job out of law school, he worked in the city attorney's office in Oakland, right up the street. He then transferred to the district attorney's office in Oakland, a little farther up the street, and worked there for 15 years, ultimately becoming the elected district attorney for Alameda County. He lived in Oakland near downtown. An ambitious man, he became California State Attorney General. A very ambitious man, he was elected three times to the governorship of California. Significantly, he captured the nominations of the Democratic, Republican, and Progressive parties. A powerful man, he was selected as Tom Dewey's running mate in the presidential election of 1948, running against Harry Truman. By a miracle, Truman won. This was the only election Earl Warren would ever lose. How different our world and the Supreme Court would have been if Dewey had won and Earl Warren had become vice president. Later, President Dwight Eisenhower appointed Earl Warren to, to the Supreme Court. But Earl Warren had a major failing. He had supported and promoted the internment of Japanese American citizens leaving, living in the coastal areas of California during World War II. A proud man, it was hard for him to admit his error. But a just man, this failure, failure gnawed at him. God worked on him. And as Earl Warren wrote in his memoirs, he grew to know he had been wrong. What had God knitted together? A man from a poor working class family, the only one of the judges featured with that background, a man who had attended public schools, the only one of the Supreme Court justices we've talked about who had, a man of, man of courage, a man who knew politic, politics, and an Oaklander, a, a man who now knew that segregation was wrong. Earl Warren would incorporate his past failure into wisdom. That was the judge. Though the technical legal question before the Supreme Court was, does the segregation of public education based solely on race violate the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment? I did have to put some legal speak here. The real question became, was segregation wrong? but success would still be difficult. After the argument, Earl Warren had to go to work and work on his justices because he needed a unanimous decision. It would take him one year of arm twisting and cajoling using all of his political skills. But on May 17, 1954, the Supreme Court, in a decision that soared, ruled that separate but equal public school facilities are inherently unequal. School segregation must end. It was a unanimous decision, the only one of the three. It was now the law of the land. The Supreme Court had spoken, there could be no appeal.
there was jubilation among the just. The Warren court would go and lead a progressive wave of decisions on housing, transportation, accommodations, the right to counsel, Miranda rights, voting rights, and more. Where was God? There was God, reshaping the country, protecting the vulnerable, changing hearts. We had come so far. And Dred Scott decided in 1857, it ruled, we are not people. And, Ples and Plessy decided in 1896, it ruled, we are not equal pe people. And Brown decided in 1954, we were all equal. There would be many, many more flight fights to come, but the world had been changed. I'm gonna go through quickly, three more minutes. The epilogue, Dred Scott. How did Dred Scott finance his case? He was illiterate, enslaved person. I'll tell you how. By the time his case came to the Supreme Court, Dred Scott's original master's sons had become abolitionists. They, along with the church, funded his case. Good people coming together. And though he lost his case, his current owner soon freed him voluntarily. God did not forget Dred Scott. He died a free man. Chief Justice Roger Taney, he was unrepentant. He continued to serve on the Supreme Court for another seven years. He blamed Lincoln for the Civil War sympathized with the Confederacy, but refused to resign. He died in office on October 12, 1864. Significance of that day, that was the day that the state of Maryland voted to abolish slavery. Taney was wrong. God would have the last word on slavery. Justice Henry B. Brown, he was the uh, author of the Plessy versus Ferguson opinion. He served 10 more years after the opinion, and then he retired from the Supreme Court. The reason he retired, he went blind. I will leave that there. The decision he authored in Plessy was voted the second worst decision in Supreme Court history. The decision voted the worst was Dred Scott. Homer Plessy, he died with the conviction on his record, but the governor of Louisiana pardoned him in 2011. At the pardon signing ceremony, with Plessy's descendants in attendance, the district attorney who prepared the application for the pardon stated, I did not prepare the application for pardon so that the state could forgive Homer Plessy. I prepared it in hopes that you, his descendants, would forgive us. Earl Warren, his court transformed the nation. He allowed God to change his heart and God used him to reshape the nation. Abraham Lincoln, we know what happened, but these words stick with me again from his sec second inaugural ad uh, address. He stated toward the, the end in a 
speech would be, which would be one of the last you would ever give in thinking about the Civil War and why it had happened and why all the suffering, he said, echoing the script, echoing scripture, God has purposes that we cannot know, but the judgments of the Lord are good altogether. Victory was long and costly. There was great suffering. At times it seemed like we would be in perpetual darkness. We could not see God's purposes, but at every step of the way, God was there with people like you and me on his team. I have constantly been reminded that we must have faith and trust the slow work of God. God always has a winning game plan. The outcome is never in doubt. Or as our pastor has said, clear eyes, full hearts, can't lose. I bid you peace. peace. Amen, amen. There are any who would uh, continue parts of this conversation? I have a page full of notes here. And I feel like over and over again, it says, where was God? God was there making moves. Uh, God was behind the scenes. Any that would add a question, a thought? In the chat, there's several students are studying many of these cases right now in their classes. Are there any others who would uh, add Thoughts, a blessing, appreciation. I don't know if I can catch all of the. Well, I would say thank you, David, because um, I was not taught these cases in the course of my education. Mm -hmm. um, so I appreciate, I appreciate the education. I appreciate that um, today's students are um, experiencing a more complete, thorough. <laughs> Um, education and, and, and resulting awareness. Thank you. You are welcome. <laughs> yes, Henry Garner. Uh, thank you very much, David. That was brilliantly done. Yes, it was. I uh, uh, inform all of you that Earl Warren lived a block and a half from my house. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Gives me hope in our day and age when there are many decisions by the Supreme Court that I wonder where God is, <laughs> how they affect all of us. So it gives me hope that there is work behind the scenes and others in line to bring more hope and more justice and more of God's beloved community. Lorraine, did you want to add more? Yes, I wanted to say that this was a superb presentation. It took me back to my high school days at an all black school where we had we did learn a lot about these cases in high school. So thank you, David. And I will just end this by saying, ain't God good. Mm -hmm. Amy. <laughs> thank, thank you, Lorraine. David. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. May we trust that God is moving, that God is working, even when we do not see it. May that be our hope. Let us continue reflecting as we uh, are blessed. Uh, in our musical ministry.
Amen. Amen. Thank you. So beautiful. I uh, this week had the opportunity to fly to Alabama and to help lead a group of leaders, pastors, others um, in learning part of our part of the Southern Black Freedom struggle um, in Birmingham and Montgomery and Selma. There was many uh, many pictures, many stories told about the lunch counter sit-ins. Um, I was uh, uh, reminded of that even as I uh, saw the newspaper article of Henry Gardner at a lunch counter in Florida. And this illustration caught my attention um, this week. Uh, this is by the same uh, illustrator that did our Advent series. Um, and this illustration, if you can see on the far side there, um, what is a... Uh, African-American man sitting in at a lunch counter um, showing love through expanding the beloved community at first I was a little uh, angered at this image because I thought it showed that uh, the communion was over on the white side of the thing uh, but I have come to understand it to be um, when he is sitting down there he is bringing communion to that table where there was not communion before in that act of love and resistance um, and uh, bravery, right, and courage, it is creating the communion table where there is not communion. Uh, to me, uh, sometimes uh, our communion tables are decorated uh, so beautifully that we forget that it is really around that table uh, where Jesus uh, did much of Jesus's work, uh, eating with those who are often shunned, uh, inviting those in who are left outside, uh, eating with those uh, the sinners uh, and the sick and the outcast. Let us always remember as we come to this communion time, hopefully you have communion elements. Uh, maybe you are like my family that is using uh, Girl Scout cookies because there are 300 boxes in our house right now. Uh, <laughs> I think they are using Girl Scout cookies as their communion bread. The bread can be the common element that is around us, right? But we are one body. We come to this table. Um, let us read together uh, the invitation to communion. The bread of heaven is here, leading us into life. We draw strength from the bread of life. The cup of blessing is at hand, bringing us salvation. We find life in the cup of blessing. Eat and drink, for Christ is here, offering us eternal life. Thanks be to God. People of God, lift up your bread if you have some. And that's Passover meal. Jesus took the bread, breaking it as his body would be broken, reminding them that they are part of the body of Christ. He took the cup as well, that it would be poured out as a sign of the new covenant. Let us take the bread of life and the cup of living water together. Let us pray. God, we invite and know all of who we are, all of the troubles and difficulties of our world around this table. We come to take the bread and the wine, the juice, to connect to you, to your hope, to your power. There are many places we ask where you are, what you are doing. We can't see it, but we have faith that you are working. If we don't have faith, give us more faith. Come in the midst of our doubts, our confusion. We desire to see your power and your beauty and your beloved community. Guide us to be a part of that. Give us that strength, that perseverance, that hope. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a few quick announcements. Um, we continue our ministry needs continue. Um, we appreciate your constant support. You can uh, send that support in or um, donate online to the different ministries. We thank you for that. Um, and we have uh, numerous announcements. Uh, hopefully you have already found your poem to share this Wednesday night. Um, but this Wednesday night we're going to have a celebration of black poetry. Please bring your poem. Um, 
to read on Wednesday night. It'll be the same link to Bible study. We will send it out, but it'll be that same space. Um, but please bring uh, even multiple poems if you desire. Let us lift those up. We'll try to share some of them on screen, but most of them will be spoken out loud from our homes. Next Sunday, we will share, have a joint service with Faith Presbyterian Church and Reverend uh, Valerie Miles Tribble will be the um, will be preaching. Um, and then the following Wednesday, we have another um, uh, Darlene Flynn from the is the chief of the Race and Equity Division of the City of Oakland will come and be in conversation with Gay um, Cobb. And so we look forward to that. We will hopefully be back in the sanctuary. The session meets uh, uh, this on the 27th, uh, this this coming Tuesday, and we will make a final discernment about that and let you all know. But the earliest we would be back would be the 27th. So uh, let us hope for that. There is also the Black Joy Parade in the city of Oakland on the 27th that we will uh, join in. Uh, we will not be marching. We will be <laughs> celebrating and watching. You can read along these other. Um, there's one more announcement. Cassandra, did you want to speak out loud about that, about the next BBC event? Or did someone from... I can speak out loud. Or maybe you're there. I see you unmuting yourself. Maybe you're joining back. Isn't Would you it? like to give the announcement? That'd be great. Well, I think that there's some conflicting information about the time of the BBC event. Uh, it looks as if we're going to uh, celebrate uh, both Black History Month and Women's History Month uh, on Wednesday, March the 23rd. Um, but we need to uh, confirm that it may be March the 30th. Uh, there's a little bit of uh, confusion about that. But in the meantime, please uh, pick up your copy of The Three Mothers, uh, written by Anna Malika Tubbs, uh, about the mothers of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X and James Baldwin. Uh, it's a fascinating book, absolutely fascinating. Uh, a little unusually written, I think. Uh, so it's a bit of a challenge, uh, but very interesting. With lots of information about the lives of these women and the way uh, their lives had an impact on their sons. So please join us with uh, with BBC and bring the stories of mothers you have known. Thanks so much, Matt. Amen. So we have 20 copies of that that I will pick up from Marcus Books uh, today or tomorrow, and you can uh, pick up your copy. If you need that delivered, I'm happy to drive that and deliver it to you. It will give us a good five, six weeks to be able to read it, um, but we are excited about this. Uh, Cassandra has read it and uh, brought it, highly recommended this book, so we are excited to uh, host this space. Um, let us, we have one final piece of music that will guide us. Oh, the night walk. If anyone would like to join us on the ceasefire night walk this, fr this Friday at 6 PM at St. Columba, this is uh, neighbors or uh, people of faith walking in a neighborhood impacted by gun violence, um, talking to neighbors, reminding them that we care about them. And we will be, uh, as part of a larger strategy, this is not the only component but it is the uh, part that people of faith can join in. But please reach out to myself um, if you would like to join us and I can give more information. Thank you, Susie, for lifting that up.
Amen, amen. I will let uh, both soloists and musicians, I will let them know um, how much they, we have all enjoyed their guiding us. Uh, people of God, uh, receive God's blessing. In those moments when we do not know where God is, no assurance. It was, we look back that God was always there. God was always moving. God was always guiding. May God's justice, may God's hope, uh, may God's future. Uh, come quickly, and may we rest assured. Amen. Amen.